We thank the Lord for it. All right, in 2 Peter chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse 5. Let me speak to you tonight on the subject, Godliness is gain. Verse 5, and beside this, you've already been told, we've already been told, that we're partakers of the divine nature. That God has given to us everything that we need to escape the corruption of this world. Everything that we need to become what God wants us to be. Paul put it like this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who worketh in you. God has already given us salvation. He saved us by grace. We're partakers of His divine nature. But now He expects us to be partners with Him, be arm in arm with Him, and add certain things to our faith. And so in verse 5 He said, And besides this, giving all diligence. Uh, This is not something to play with. This is something to give yourself to. And besides this, giving all diligence to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall or stumble. I call your attention to verse 6. And to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. We should add godliness to our life. What do you think of when you hear the word godliness or holiness? Well, you might think about a group that calls themselves holiness and that emphasizes the fact of godliness. And their services are loud and their services are very emotional. Uh, Their services have a lot of uh, mysticism to it. Uh, There's a lot of dreams and visions involved in it. There's a lot of new revelations involved in it. And they call themselves holiness people and uh, right likened to the matter of godliness. Or you might think of a godly mother or a godly grandmother or a godly father or a godly grandfather that as far as you were concerned, you could look at them and you would say that is a godly person. That is a godly man. That is a godly woman. Uh, You might think about your own dad, your own mother. You might think about a pastor that led you in the past and you felt that he was a godly man. Someone in your life and you would say that is a godly person. Well, every one of us, I think tonight, would say, I'd like to be godly. But we might be a little bit fearful of using that word. We might be a little fearful of using that term. Me, godly? You mean I can be godly? I should be godly? I just don't think I can attain that. I think I'm far from that. And I would have to say that many Christians probably are far from godliness. Far from holiness. As a matter of fact, I would say that would probably be a subject that would be far from the minds of a lot of Christians. Uh, They would be far too concerned with what's going to happen tomorrow or what happened last week, or what's happening in their life, rather than concentrating and zeroing in on a life of godliness. But the Bible has a lot to say about godliness. Uh, Think about godly influence. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to turn, but turn if you sometime turn back to the book of Genesis and begin reading in Genesis 12 through chapter 21, and notice the godly influence of Abraham. Abraham made his mistakes, there's no doubt about it. As a matter of fact, there were some things Abraham did that followed him along his path and caused him trouble down his life. He didn't deal with some things. David did the same thing. And yet he was a man of faith, and yet David was called a man after God's own heart. But here's the godly influence of Abraham. Had Lot followed the example of Abraham, he would have not lost his family. He would have not lost his testimony. 
Abraham was a man of faith and was a godly man, even though he had failures and fears. But he was a godly man. Lot should have watched that faith and should have watched the way he lived and uh, followed after that. And so it's very important that we have godly figures in our lives. It's very important that we have men that influence us toward the matter of godliness. As a matter of fact, I think I could safely say tonight, any man or any woman who's ever done anything for God had a real godly influence in their life. And you would probably think of someone tonight and you would say it's because of that man. It is because of that woman that I have moved forward in the Christian life. They influenced me greatly. I saw them. I watched them. I scrutinized their life. I saw them when things were going well. I think, saw them when things were going terrible, when disaster struck. And yet, here's a godly man. Here's a godly woman uh, that influenced me. Now watch this. The Bible says that if we live a godly life, that He, the Lord Jesus, our Heavenly Father, will protect us and will deliver us from temptation if we're living a godly life. Just turn over a page or two to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. A godly influence, but then God says, those that are godly, I'll deliver them from temptation. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. The Lord... Knoweth. The word knoweth there is simply means God is aware of what's going on in our life. He is aware of the temptation that we are facing. He is aware of how intense it is. But he is also aware of the means by which he can bring us out of this temptation. That he can deliver us from it. It also has the idea of understanding. God understands what I'm facing. God understands what you are facing. And it seems to me from this passage of Scripture that there is a deeper intensity that God will work to help us and deliver us in temptation to the man or the woman whose desire is to be godly. I said a while ago and I say again, not too many Christians have a real intense desire to be godly. Now, a godly Christian has his failures and his fears and his setbacks and his defeats. He's aware of them. You're aware of them, I'm sure. But I just feel that this verse is indicating that if I have a real bent toward godliness, and if you have a real bent toward godliness, that God has a way of coming to you and giving you aid because He knows, He understands, he is aware of what's going on and will deliver you from temptation. So here's what he says. The Lord knoweth. He is aware. He understands how to deliver. And the word deliver there is draw away. God has a way, a means of drawing us away. He says to deliver the godly out of temptation. And the word godly here is devout or reverent. Here's a Christian that has a reverence for God. Here's a Christian who has, is devoted to God. The Lord knows how to deliver him. How to draw him out of temptation. And to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. So follow along with me now. Godliness. The influence of godliness. God has a way of drawing Pulling away the godly out of temptation. Protecting them not only from the temptation uh, at this point in their life, but protecting them in the days ahead. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. The Bible has something else to say about the matter of godliness here in this passage of Scripture. In verse 7, I want you to notice that the Bible teaches us that we ought to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Verse 7, but refuse, and the word refuse is a strong word. It means to avoid or to reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Just like an athlete exercises himself. 
uh, so he can be the best that he can be. Can you imagine a baseball player going into spring training that has not kept his body up during the course of the offseason? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a football player in the NFL as uh, strong and as big and as fast as the game is today? Can you imagine an NFL player going into the season, going into preseason, and he's not kept up his body during the offseason? He's not ran. He's not lifted weights. Uh, Why, he would be a prime target for a serious injury, wouldn't he? Well, don't you think the same thing would be true in the Christian life? The godly man, the Christian, we ought to exercise ourselves in godliness. You know, sometimes we get the props knocked right out from under us. And sometimes we experience serious defeats because we have not exercised ourselves unto godliness. Lots an example of that. He did not exercise himself in godly things. Uh, The Bible said he looked towards Sodom and he moved towards Sodom and he moved into Sodom and then Sodom moved into him. And the Bible said that when uh, these angels came that he was sitting at the gate. That was a place of authority. That was a place of leadership. Apparently he had some position of leadership in Sodom in that wicked city. And there he sat and uh, he was told what was going to happen. The city was going to be destroyed and he told his family about it and his Uh, family laughed at him and his wife was turned into a pillow of salt. Why did all of that happen? Because he failed to exercise himself unto godliness. And so sometimes you and I will have bruising defeats, serious defeats, serious setbacks uh, that sometimes we'll not uh, uh, get over quickly. We'll have to uh, face them in the future because we do not exercise ourselves unto godliness. Look at the next verse, verse 8, and here's a very good verse. It talks about the matter of godliness being profitable or or having great gain to those that are godly. Look at verse 8. For godly exercise or bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable. And the word profitable there is advantage. The Christian that exercises himself in godliness has an advantage over the ordinary Christian. The average day-to-day Christian. The weak Christian, the Christian that never exercises himself in godliness, this Christian, it is at, it, to his advantage as he goes through life uh, to face whatever comes his way. So he says, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, if you believe that verse, that godliness is profitable in all things, uh, then I take it that that means that when I look at my finances and I make financial decisions in my personal life and in my family life, if I'm a godly man, I've got an advantage in that area because God's going to give me direction there. Uh, I take that to mean that if I'm a godly man, and if you're a godly man or a godly woman, that in dealing with your family affairs, you're going to have an advantage. Think about the husband and wife that can't get on the same page about child discipline or about money or making decisions or whatever it may be. One may be seeking after godliness, the other one may not. Uh, Neither one of them may not be really concerned about godliness. But think about a man and a woman who are striving for godliness in their family. They have an advantage in the discipline of children or whatever it may be. Godliness, he says, is profitable in all things, in every area of life. I guess that would spill over into our business life, wouldn't it? I would say that spill over into our social life and uh, our friendships and whatever it may be. So you get the idea here? He's trying to say godliness is profitable in all areas, in every area of life. Then look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. And here's an amazing verse. Uh, Godliness brings satisfaction. Look at it. But godliness with contentment is great Gain, Not just gain, but great gain. I don't know about you, but when I read these verses, I'm impressed with the idea that life will be a lot better for me and smoother for me and 
uh, knowing that God is with me if I'm pursuing, if I'm seeking after godliness. Then look down in verse 11, 1 uh, Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things... And follow, and the word follow there is pursue. There's something that a man is to pursue, a woman is to to pursue. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Follow after these things, but one of those things that we're to pursue is godliness. Young people, what are you pursuing? What What are you pursuing? What drives you? What's the focus of your life? You young singles that are here tonight, what are you pursuing in life? What are you reaching for? What are you reaching after? Is it godliness or is it something else? Now quickly tonight, put down just a few thoughts concerning this matter of godliness is great gain. Number one, I want you to think about its definition. What is the definition of godliness? Well, first of all, it does not mean to be godlike. Now, hear uh, what I'm saying. It is impossible for you and I to be like God in His nature, in His true essence. You and I can never attain that. God is God. Now, I am to be like Him in character. Uh, John said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, We will be like Him when we get to heaven. But we will be completely like Him there in character. But we'll never obtain that divine uh, spark, if you will, that divinity that God has because we'll never have that. Now, we will be developing, I believe, in that throughout the endless ages of eternity. But I can never have the nature of God. Now, I can be partaker of that nature that is the more I progress in godliness uh, then the more like him I am in character but I would certainly never be able to attain what God is now the Bible says no man can look on God and I think that something in that area still holds true even when we get to heaven because the Bible says that in Jesus will all the fullness of the Godhead mightily be contained. Think about that. Seems that when we get to heaven, it will be the Lord Jesus that we will be focused up on. And there's a great mystery in that, isn't there? And we'll see Him, for we'll see Him as He is, but we'll never be able to obtain uh, that uh, nature of His. But it is, I think it does mean this, It means a constant consciousness and awareness of God. I think that's what it does mean. I'm partaker of His nature. I'm to strive to be like the Lord Jesus. I am to be aware that He is living and that He is real and that He wants to make Himself real to me. I think it's exemplified in the life of Moses. Uh, Hebrews 11, 27 says this, that he saw him who was invisible. Now let that sink in for just a moment. The Bible said that Moses sought after and saw him who was invisible. Now again, that did not mean that Moses saw the essence, the real nature of God, but there was a way that this man lived that he saw things that others did not see. He was aware, he was striving after, he was reaching forth uh, unto godliness and seeking him who was invisible. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Add to your faith godliness. And so here's the definition. No, we'll never be exactly what God is. But thank God if we're saved, we're partakers of His divine nature. And uh, we're to draw closer and closer and closer and closer to Him. Secondly, I want you to notice the details concerning this matter of godliness. Uh, What do we mean by this? Well, first of all, I think it's a recognition of His presence in our lives. Are you conscious of Him being with you every day? Somehow we have the idea, sometimes I think, that 
We come to church on Sunday and we listen to the songs and we sing and we fellowship and there's the presence of the Lord there. And then uh, Monday morning we wake up and we just sort of forget. Well, you know, know, he's up there somewhere. And he's around somewhere and he's aware of what's going on. But is there a real sense of awareness of his presence in our life every day? If there was, we might say things a little different. And we might do things a little bit different in private and at home and in places where we think that no one sees Godliness, uh, we are aware that He's standing beside us every single day. There's the realization of the greatness of God. You'll never be able to comprehend Him. This universe is so vast. And the galaxies, and now they have some of these telescopes that look out. And I don't know whether, uh, just how far to, to, to take some of this, but they say that they can look so far out into space uh, that they can go back in, in time. And, and I'm not sure about all If you want to get married, you better do some serious thinking. If you want to get married, wherever God uh, wants you to go will be where God wants your husband to go. So get that settled right away. God leads through the husband. If God's called him to be a preacher, you better settle on something. You're going to be a preacher's wife. Now, if you don't feel that's God's will for you, then you better not marry a preacher. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? And I know that's not popular preaching in this modern day, but my Bible is still true. And I'm not ashamed to preach it. I never will forget in a revival service just after Sue and I had gotten married and just a young preacher, and she was just really young, and, and she was all, uh, I'm a pastor's wife, and learning all of this. And I remember she came forward one night, and we had our evangelist, and she came to him, and she said, you know I'm praying about God's will. And the preacher said, you don't have to pray about that. And she said, I don't, but I'm sure of this. It doesn't matter how far out there they can go, God's already been there. Amen. And is there now. Amen. Amen. I'm 58 years old. That's a long time. You didn't have to say amen. Uh, but that is, a, that is a long time. But think about 58 million years. Can you comprehend that? Light years. Can you comprehend that? Just think of 58 million years in the past. God is already there. 58 million years in the future, he's already there. He lives in the eternal presence. And yet cares enough about me that he wants me to talk to him of a morning when I wake up. And talk to him at night when I go to bed. And he said, no, he said, "Uh, whatever God's will is for your husband, that'll be it. You know what she said that night? Boy, that takes a big burden off me. I'll just go wherever Bob goes. And she has. Even in the New York. I quoted that verse in whatever state, be content, even if it's New York. (laughs) Snow and sleet and all the rest of it. Just But you're submissive to the direction of God. And that's the third thing I want to talk tonight about direction. Now when it comes to this matter of godliness, there are two things to remember quickly. One is doctrine. If you want God's direction for your life, you better know the cardinal doctrines of this book. Some people don't like doctrine, but I'm going to tell you something. Doctrine comes first. Paul always taught that in his epistles. Doctrine first and then the practical outworkings. And ask him and tell him that I love him. And let him tell me that he loves me. What are the details to this matter of godliness? I think it also means that there is a submission to the authority of God. You and I will never be godly until we submit to him as our Lord and Master. I know you've heard the story of F.B. Meyer. I know you've heard that. Some missionaries came to his church for a missionary conference. And he detected that they had something that he didn't have. And he was already pastor of a great church. 
And finally he asked one of the men, he said, I've watched you all week. You seem to have something that I don't have. What is it? And one of the men said this, does the Lord have every key to your life? And he said he got to thinking about that and he said he told the Lord. I was uh, about two or three times a week I'll do a walk around in our campus here and go through the rooms and I'll go through all the facilities and everything just to see what's going on and see who I can harass and if I can ring some bells and I, I enjoy it, you know. And, and so I'm down through here and coming back up through here and I'm, I'm starting to go back at, toward the auditorium and I see a white car in a parking lot and this lady gets out and she says, Hey! And I said, Yes. And she said, Are you one of the preachers here? I said, Yeah, I'm one of the preachers here. And she said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. She got about eight books out of her car and laid them up on the hood. She said, "Um, I'm from Henderson. And she said, I've been reading these books. And every one of the books was on the cults. And she said, I don't know who's right and who's wrong. She said, I've been going to a church that believes. And then she went on to describe what they believed. And she said, but you know, this book says this. Lord, you can have every key but this one. I'm going to keep it. It's mine. This this, this is my key. I'm going to keep this. And the Lord said, you either give me all of the keys or nothing at all. And finally, he made that decision. He said, Lord, here's the last key. Here's the last key. You can have it. This is the key. The last key to my life. Every key is yours now. And F.B. Meyer said it was then that the power of God began to work in my life in a new and in a a fresh way. Have I said to him, Lord, you own everything. You're you're everything. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say whatever you want me to say. I'm just going to go. You know, I lived in one county 33 years except for crossing the line into Hamilton County to go to Tennessee Temple to college pastored my home church for 18 years and you know what I was set that I was never going to and she opened it and read it to me laid it down picked it up and this book says this this book says that and uh, I don't want to be unkind but a wild look got in her eye and I'm looking around and where's Anthony you know (laughs) situation like that calls for a Duke fan amen and so Then she said, now listen to this. Then she said, you know, I sense that God's people need to get together. I sense, she started getting wild. And she said, I'm going to pray, touch my hand. I said, honey, I'm not touching your hand. I don't need you to pray for me. And then it came out. She's one of the, remember, one of these wild cult groups that sees things and hears things. One man told me, I said, are you saved? He said, I know I am. I said, how do you know you're saved? He said, I was sitting on my bed one night and an angel came down through the roof, floated down, sat beside of my bed and looked at me and said, you're saved. And I said, well, Steve, I just had it in my mind. I'm going to pastor this church till I die. This is where I love. I love the church. I love the people. And I love this area and I'm staying here. And stayed there for 18 years and all as pastor and an associate pastor of that church. And then God said, I've got other ideas for you. And that was hard. But you have to say yes to God. Wherever it may be. And so I wonder, have we submitted to His authority? I think it also means this, submission to the direction that God has for us. I like what I'm seeing in our youth group. I'll just be very frank with you. I like what I'm seeing with our young people saying, what does God want me to do? And some of them coming forward and say, I will give my life for full-time service for whatever God wants me to do, wherever He wants me to go. Now let me say something to the young ladies that are here that are preparing to serve God. The first thing I would have done is jump through the window. That's the first thing I would have done. And you know what I told him? I said, Paul said this, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you. Other than the gospel we preached unto you, let him be accursed. And I said to her, ma'am, the first thing you need to do is get your doctrine right. Now she didn't want to hear that. You got it? She didn't want to hear that. She didn't want to hear about the death and the burial and the resurrection and the virgin birth and all of that. She wanted some kind of wild way out stuff. Better know your doctrines. 
cardinal doctrines of the faith. And then there will be practice, uh, the practice of living out uh, those doctrines in your life. You see, uh, there must be a, a God consciousness that shows in our actions and is demonstrated in our faith. And then the last thing I want to say to you tonight about this matter of godliness is its demands. It's demands. There's a negative and a positive side. First of all, the negative sides. It'll keep me away from things that please the devil. Godliness will keep me away from the things that please the devil. Paul warned us, he said, don't let the devil get a foothold in your life. There are things the devil will use to get a foothold in our life. But if we're striving after godliness, uh, it'll keep us away uh, from those things. It'll keep me away from the things that displease God. Now, I know what things displease him because he tells them in his book. Amen? And then there's a positive side. Uh, It'll keep me straight. This matter of godliness will keep me straight in tough times. Don't you think tough times will come to a Christian? You better believe they will. Let me say to our young ladies and our young men that have said in the last few weeks, I give myself to the Lord. Satan hates that. He hates it. And young man or young lady, he'll try to keep you away from a Christian school, a Christian college. He'll try to keep you away from the will of God. Uh, He'll put someone in your path that looks so good and you feel like maybe there's something else for you out there. And there will be a thousand decisions you'll have to make. And if you've made a decision to serve God, don't let anything stop you. And keep moving straight forward all the way through. And then this matter of godliness will... Help me to increase in my knowledge of God, who He is, and the way that He works. And I need to know that. I need to know that, and you need to know that. Let's go back to our text. 2 Peter 1, verse 6. Add to your faith, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness. Add to your faith, godliness. Am I striving after godliness? Would you stand with heads bowed? I'm going to ask Brother Claiborne to come and lead us in just as I am without one plea. And as we sing, you know the song with heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to ask tonight if God has spoken to your heart about the matter of godliness. Are you pursuing godliness? Are you running after godliness? Are you exercising yourself unto godliness? If you are, praise the Lord. But if not, maybe you need to come tonight and come to the altar and get on your knees and you want to say, Lord, forgive me for not wanting to know you more. What a fascinating thing it is to know God and to know more and more and more of Him. Heavenly Father, this is your invitation. And if there are those tonight who need to come, I pray that they will. Our heads are bowed. You're singing together tonight as Christians. Pray. If you need to come, our altar is open for you. and people are praying here at the front. The matter of godliness, how important it is. 
And if God is touching, nudging your heart tonight, then I would invite you to come. You know, we have a great number of believers in this world today who are just satisfied and complacent. Oh, they know, maybe they know enough just to make them dangerous, but not enough to be godly. They have a desire for certain things, but not the desire to be godly as they should. Let's sing one of those stanzas, Brother Claiborne, give us a chance to come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without a lamb of God I come. Heavenly Father, help us to walk a godly path. Lord, we know that it's not a mystical, magical, far-out kind of a thing. And we know that it does not mean perfection. For we'll have our failures and our setbacks. But we do know that it's the best thing for every believer. Help us now and bless those that have come. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, if you will, please. Now let me call our church conference to order tonight, and we'll do so as we always do by reading of Scripture and prayer. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. Let me ask our deacons and planning committee, if you will, to come and take your seat at the front, please. Our deacons and our planning committee, if you'll come to the front and just take a seat, and we'll move right forward tonight. All right, Nehemiah. Chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse 2. Then Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnants that are left of the captivity that are in the providence are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I beseech beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night. And the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying... If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye return unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them... Uh, though they, we were of your, your cast down to the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Father, we pray you'll lead us tonight. We want your will to be done. Pray that you'll lead every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been asked several times since I've been here as your pastor, are we moving to the new property? And I've not answered that, and the reason I've not answered that is because of circumstances, and the Lord has not given any kind of a direct leading toward that. However, let me say tonight, I believe eventually we'll have to move to our new property. That might be two years, it might be ten years, but I think eventually we'll have to. We're being forced in here more and more and more and more. A convenience store is going to be going on over here and so forth. And this is going to become, in my opinion and from what I'm hearing, a, a commercial area. And we're going to have commercial businesses all around us. And if that happens, the security of the school and the security of our children uh, will be paramount in our thinking. And we'll uh, quite possibly have to make arrangements. And that would mean, of course, selling this property or if God gives us Uh, a windfall of money, we'd move out there. Now, 
to do what we would need to do out there as far as a school and a church was, is concerned was going to take a lot of money. At least $5 million. We don't have that now. Now, if we got $6 million for this property or $5 million for this property, obviously we could do something in that area and we could move out there. But that's not happened. That's not materialized. And remember I said that when you're looking for the will of God, remember three things. What's God saying to you in the Scripture? Peace in the heart and the circumstances. So, we're waiting on God. There's still questions that need to be answered as far as 401 is concerned. Which way it's going to go and that kind of thing. We don't have any answers on that except they have told us the construction will begin June of 2005. That's just the beginning of construction. There's sewer questions to be answered, uh, water questions to be answered, and so forth. So as far as a complete move out there is concerned, we don't have any clear direction on that yet. However, God gave us the property. And we're using it some, but we're not using it to the fullest of its extent. Now, uh, I think that we, every decision we make will be based on souls. Every decision we make, souls, or to enter in to that decision. Now, I understand that there was a day... Uh, that the church was the hub of society. There wasn't anything else to do but go to church. That's it. That, and people went to church. We live in a different day now. There's all kinds of things to do now. There's all kinds of things to attract people. And uh, I think that we ought to be equipped to best serve the Lord in the community. And if some of these things will help us uh, reach families and people, I feel God will bless it. Now, there were some things that we did not know, that we didn't have any answers to, and so that's the reason I didn't say anything. And I'm not going to make an announcement unless I have something definite to give you. Now tonight the planning committee does have something definite to give you, answers to give you, concerning the property. And what we can do with it. And I'm going to ask Brother Johnny in a moment and Brother Drew in a moment to put the PowerPoint up. And they're going to show you what we have found, the findings out there. And you'll be pleased at how God, and by the way, uh, Johnny will fill you in on how God is leading in this area. And that's one of the things that has really uh, touched my heart about knowing the will of God is because I saw God working in an unusual way. And you're going to hear about that. When God speaks in His Word and when you have peace in your heart, then the circumstances will begin to fall in place. And you'll see how God has used a man who is now with the Lord to save us thousands of dollars. You'll hear about that in a few moments. Uh, we'd like a pavilion out there uh, so that we can have our Sunday school meetings and just all kinds of things can be done out there.